Hello, uh, in this class uh, we are going to look at uh, the material zirconia. Uh, we are looking at this material in the context of uh, nanomaterials in general and in particular in the context of uh, thermodynamic aspects associated with nanomaterials. Uh, this is just an example of uh, a material where you can see these effects. Uh, presumably you can look at other materials and uh, see somewhat similar uh, uh, effects uh, in certain cases and uh, this is just to show you what is uh, possible and what can happen when you go to the nano scale. Uh, so, it is in that context that we look at it. So, interestingly zirconia is a material that we do not talk about much at home. Uh, so, when you are uh, you know discussing something with your friends, uh, you are discussing uh, uh, things with your uh, uh, you know maybe family members about any, any substance at home or materials at home and so on. Uh, you do not tend to talk about the material zirconia. Uh, interestingly though, you will find uh, through the examples that I am going to show you uh, that it is a material that is uh, very commonly being used by us. Uh, it is being used in various uh, applications that uh, we are familiar with. It is just that we are not aware that uh, zirconia is sitting there uh, and you know we talk of coal, we talk of carbon, we talk of hydrogen economy, uh, we talk of semiconductors, we talk of silicon. So many other materials we tend to talk about. Uh, uh, which are even you know somewhat technical uh, kind of materials uh, as opposed to commonplace materials like wood uh, and maybe you know construction materials like concrete. Uh, but this is a material which is there very much uh, present in many of the activities that uh, uh, we uh, involve ourselves in, but we do not uh, hear about it much, uh, we are not aware of it much. So, in fact through these examples I believe uh, you are going to be quite surprised at where all we uh, run into zirconia. First of all I am uh, pretty sure we have all. Uh, heard of diamond uh, and uh, you know how interesting it is and how expensive it is and so on. Uh, there is another version uh, of uh, you know uh, gemstone so to speak which is nothing but cubic zirconia. Uh, so, if you actually uh, in, in the Indian context uh, certainly uh, I mean people refer to it as the American diamond. Uh, I am not really sure uh, what the origin of this uh, phrase is, but in India if you go to many of these uh, stores where they make this kind of. Uh, jewellery where they make uh, you know say a necklace uh, which is uh, you know um, filled with these kinds of uh, artificial diamonds as they are called, uh, they tend to call them as American diamonds. Uh, if you actually go to uh, uh, some of the foreign countries, you will find it being referred to as uh, the American uh, I mean sorry the as cubic zirconia only, they do not really refer to it as the American diamond. Uh, but this is uh, something that is used in jewellery and uh, interestingly. Uh, just to give you uh, some idea of uh, what we are dealing with here, if you took the pure diamond, the real diamond uh, and you actually uh, you know get this kind of a specification of the diamond, then uh, apparently as per current market rates you are looking at uh, about a million rupees, about 1 million rupees. Um, so, about uh, uh, so that is if you divide that by about 70 which is uh, what the US dollar rate is. So, you are looking at uh, say um, uh, 100,000 by 7, so it is about 15,000 dollars. So, roughly, roughly approximately 15,000 dollars, 15,000 US dollars. Okay. And uh, if you look at the cubic zirconia, which is also called the American diamond, as I said, uh, then you are looking at a price which is uh, 3 orders of magnitude less uh, in cost. So, it is only about for a similar specification, um, it is uh, cost is only about 1000 rupees and so that is actually just about 15 dollars. So, you can see the difference I mean one is uh, 15000 dollars, the other is uh, just 15 dollars. And in fact, for a common person such as myself, uh, I would not know the difference uh, if in fact, if, if anything. Um, the few times that I have been shown uh, materials uh, I mean uh, uh, gemstones made of cubic zirconia uh, versus uh, the real diamond, I always thought that the cubic zirconia, zirconia sample looked better, it looked uh, much more uh, uh, glittery to me in, uh, uh, to view and uh, uh, but that apparently is not the uh, you know market value for it and the market value is based on some other uh, uh, arbitrary uh, aspects such as uh, uh, availability and so on. Uh, so, incidentally I mean uh, many of these things uh, are interestingly priced uh, because I think uh, if the availability is rare, uh, people assume that it has value 
and that is a very strange way of uh, associating value with it. Uh, so, for example, I, I, if you are uh, aware of it, I am not sure if you are aware of it, uh, but in uh, at, at one point in time uh, historically uh, in Europe, uh, it turned out that uh, when they had just, just about sort of discovered uh, aluminum and uh, it was very difficult to make aluminum at that point in time. Uh, so, it used to be that royalty would eat with aluminum plates and then uh, the uh, less important guests at, a, uh, at an official uh, dinner would eat with the silver plates or gold plates and so on. Uh, then of course, you know how things have completely changed. Today, uh, aluminum is like one of the cheapest uh, materials uh, that, is, uh, that is out there and you are uh, extremely unlikely to see anybody who, who remotely considers them, themselves to be royal to actually be using uh, aluminum utensils. So, uh, that is the, that's the way things have changed, but uh, that is just an aside. Uh, that's, uh, it is interesting to see how uh, uh, values are ascribed to different things and uh, that is the kind of uh, price difference uh, we are talking about. Uh, so, is it suddenly possible that the value of diamonds could fall? Uh, well, uh, if you look at science fiction, uh, you will see that uh, uh, the there is a belief that it is uh, the right kind of conditions to form diamond uh, exists, uh, let us say at the center of uh, a gas a gaseous uh, planet such as uh, uh, Saturn uh, or Jupiter, where there is very high pressure, high temperature and a significant amount of carbon. Uh, so, science fiction uh, stories have been written, uh, I think there is one by Arthur C. Clarke where they uh, uh, suggest that there is a huge diamond sitting in the middle of uh, uh, one of those uh, planets and as a result the price of diamond falls. So, uh, that is just an aside, but that tells you how things uh, are valued. Um, so, in our case our, uh, 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 our interest is in the fact that zirconia is used as a uh, gemstone and presently that is the kind of value it has. If you take uh, zirconia, it can actually exist in different uh, uh, you know crystal structures. Uh, it can be monoclinic, it can be tetragonal and it can be cubic. So, these are different phases of uh, zirconia and you can see the transformation temperatures at 1170 degrees uh, centigrade, the monoclinic phase goes to become the tetragonal phase and then above 200 and, uh, 2370 degrees C, you get the cubic phase. So, uh, this is the these are the three phases that we tend to see of uh, monoclinic uh, tetragonal and cubic uh, zirconia and uh, you can also have uh, uh, amorphous versions of uh, zirconia. And as always you can always uh, you know find ways to uh, make one phase stable at different conditions and so on. And uh, But in general if you take zirconia uh, and you look at it at room temperature you will find the monoclinic phase. So, this is what you will see and these are some of the you know symmetry uh, aspects associated with these three phases uh, that you see here. Of course, the cubic phase means uh, the three lattice parameters, uh, lattice constants are the same and uh, the three angles are all equal to uh, 90 degrees. So, that is the cubic phase. Uh, the tetragonal phase uh, has a little less symmetry than the cubic phase. So, one of the uh, uh, lattice parameters is not equal to the other two lattice constants uh, and uh, but the angles are all 90 degrees. And then when you come to the monoclinic phase, you have uh, this variation. Uh, so, the three uh, lattice uh, constants are not equal to each other, A is not equal to B, not equal to C, plus you also have one angle which is not equal to 90 degrees. So, you can see a uh, steady drop in symmetry uh, from as you come from cubic to tetragonal to monoclinic. Uh, so, uh, that is just to give you some idea of uh, the system that we are dealing with uh, and uh, what we see is that uh, at uh, room temperature the monoclinic phase uh, is stable. Uh, the uh, idea that we are going to actually discuss through this class is the fact that as you go to the nanomaterial uh, uh, regime, nanoscale regime of this exact same material and then you look at the different phases that are stable, you will find that there is an interesting change uh, in terms of which phase is stable at the room temperature. Okay? So, and that change in uh, stability of the phases has been directly affected by uh, the fact that it is now at the nanoscale and that is the impact of uh, nano, uh, nanoscale uh, activity. Uh, with respect to the thermodynamic stability of uh, phases uh, uh, that are present. So, uh, you can actually get something called yttria stabilized zirconia, uh, which is cubic structure of zirconia uh, oxide stabilized at room temperature and that is done by adding yttrium oxide. So, uh, yttrium oxide is uh, uh, Y2O3 and uh, you can see here that uh, yttrium is uh, a trivalent ion in this case. So, you have uh, 3 plus uh, ions 
as opposed to ZrO2 where uh, zirconium is 4 plus. So, this is 4 plus oxidation state here y is 3 plus. So, uh, it turns out that to some degree you can put these 3 plus ions into the 4 plus ion site and uh, which means that there, are, there have to be some vacancies on the oxygen sites to ensure that there is charge balance. You cannot have charge neutrality, there is it has to be a charge neutral uh, material, the uh, nature will try to get it to be charge neutral and uh, it ends up that you have oxygen ion vacancies and <coughs> because of these vacancies you actually have better oxygen transport in uh, some of this uh, yttria stabilized zirconia. So, it is actually used for uh, solid oxide fuel cells uh, and uh, uh, for that particular uh, reason. And usually uh, it will be uh, something that is uh, stabilized using 8 mole percent yttrium. So, this is the uh, way in which it is done, uh, 8 mole percent yttria is used and that keeps it stable. And uh, it still has a, a situation where you have to actually operate it at high temperature and uh, only at that high temperature the oxygen ion conductivity is sufficient that you can use this material uh, for the uh, purposes that it is intended. It is used in multiple places, this is just an example and I will uh, touch upon it again uh, as we uh, go through the discussion. It is also an efficient catalyst, so uh, uh, it is quite stable and it, uh, it is able to catalyze a uh, number of organic reactions, so under, uh, under those conditions it is uh, quite stable. and. Uh, at uh, you know if fine enough uh, particle size it has enough surface energy that it is able to catalyze uh, a number of uh, organic uh, synthesis reactions. So, zirconia is used as a catalyst in a number of uh, applications. Because it is a sort of a ther uh, ceramic uh, material and it is also you know uh, quite uh, um, uh, in it is capable of handling uh, temperature differences uh, to a fair degree, it is used in something called a thermal barrier coating. Uh, often in fact abbreviated as TBC. So, there is a lot of people who work on these uh, coatings. So, this is used on turbine blades. So, you have a blade like that, some kind of a blade. So, uh, turbine blade and so it is used as a coating on top of this blade on the side that is going to face the uh, uh, you know incoming uh, uh, gases. The incoming gases are typically very hot. Uh, so, you can see temperatures of the order of 1500 degrees C. Uh, and uh, so, uh, even though you have materials that can actually uh, uh, handle high temperatures, they deteriorate, uh, deteriorate uh, fast under those high temperature conditions. So, uh, thermal barrier coatings are an one additional layer of coating that is put on top of this uh, uh, turbine blade, which ensures that it takes the brunt of the high temperature. So, the uh, maximum high temperature is handled by it and then uh, you know a distinctly lower temperature reaches the is, is what is experienced by the uh, main structure of the blade and in this uh, process it helps uh, protect the blades. So, a lot of electricity that we get uh, which uses turbines uh, often has this uh, coating uh, uh, of zirconia uh, being put on this uh, uh, turbine blade. Artificial teeth. Again, so, uh, a, uh, a product that you know uh, you may have seen at, at your home. I mean, uh, maybe at, depending on uh, the you know uh, dental situation uh, uh, amongst various people at home. Uh, uh, maybe you may have uh, older people uh, or even middle-aged people who require uh, some artificial tooth to be put into their system, and it turns out that artificial teeth are made of zirconia. Uh, interesting thing is. Uh, the zirconia uh, here has exactly the same kind of you know texture and look and color as our teeth. So, if you actually see somebody with an artificial tooth made of zirconia, you would not know the difference. It is uh, very difficult for you to know the difference. Uh, it has got excellent strength and so when you you know chew on food and you bite onto various food, it is able to handle things very well just the way your normal tooth would uh, do and it fits very well uh, to our uh, uh, you know mouth. Um, particularly because it is going to be in your mouth, it is going to be in contact with your gums and the food that you eat is going to go, is going to be chewed by it. Uh, it is very important that this material be biocompatible and in, it turns out that zirconia is biocompatible. It is also important that it does not cause, cause allergic reactions and uh, this is also true with zirconia, it does not cause uh, allergic reactions. Uh, now again, it is uh, very interesting to see that uh, we saw an example a short while ago in this class where uh, we were saying that zirconia is used as a gemstone. 
So now if you look at uh, say a diamond, even if, uh, you, if you if you not even examined it closely, you do uh, I mean have the sense that it is some kind of a crystal clear uh, you know material uh, with which has a lot of uh, internal reflections and so on and then it, it uh, glitters as you I mean it gives off lot of reflections when you show it in light. Uh, but in principle it is something that has a tendency to look transparent at some level okay at some at some uh, uh, you know inherent level you are seeing some level of transparency with uh, different uh, you know reflections coming off of it. Uh, so when zirconia is used as a gemstone it is actually being used in a uh, in a uh, manner where it mimics the uh, diamonds uh, you know look and so therefore it also shows some level of transparency and so on. But uh, when you use it as a tooth you are actually look using it as an opaque material which is white in color okay. So uh, as uh, artificial diamond it is clear artificial tooth it is white and opaque right. So, it is white and opaque when, uh, when it is used as an artificial tooth. So, how does that happen? It happens for multiple reasons. Uh, uh, the uh, primary reason it will it will happen is based on whether it is a single crystal or a polycrystal. So, typically the gemstone would be a single crystal uh, where it is being used as a gemstone it would be a single crystal and so it would have perfect crystalline order from one end to the other and uh, being a ceramic since it has a very uh, uh, large band gap uh, it does not absorb uh, the uh, incident radiation it does not absorb visible light. So, visible light goes right through it uh, and therefore you see it as a transparent material. It's, it still has when it is used as a tooth uh, as an artificial tooth it is still the same material it still has the same band gap which is the large band gap. So, technically even as artificial tooth it should actually not absorb any uh, light you should actually see a transparent artificial tooth you do not see that you actually see a white tooth. And the reason that is uh, the case is because it is polycrystalline uh, in this case it is single crystal this case it is polycrystalline polycrystal and because it is a polycrystal with a fine uh, crystallite size uh, the light that enters this system uh, undergoes a lot of different uh, reflections due to all those uh, discontinuities that are there that the boundaries between the different uh, small crystals. As a result you end up seeing a lot of light being reflected right back and so even though inherently it is a transparent material you end up seeing it as an opaque material right. So, that is how it is and it is no different than really you know if you take powdered glass it suddenly looks opaque it uh, whereas if you take a single sheet of glass it looks transparent right. So, that is sort of the idea here and uh, that is what it is. So, it is used for artificial teeth for all these reasons that it is biocompatible and does not cause uh, allergic reactions it fits very well looks exactly like your tooth. Okay, zirconia is also used for oxygen sensors. Okay, so again, a product that we use quite extensively, uh, we don't realize that we use it. So most modern automobiles have an oxygen sensor. So if you have, uh, you know, commuted in any form uh, from your home to your uh, college uh, or place of work, uh, you have used uh, either a bike or a, a car or uh, some four-wheeler or a bus or some some such form of transport. In any modern uh, construction of those uh, vehicles uh, in the exhaust uh, line there is an oxygen sensor and typically that oxygen sensor is made out of zirconia. The purpose of the oxygen sensor is that in olden days when they first came up with automobiles they would simply put in a certain amount of fuel and certain amount of oxygen and that would burn it would generate energy and then you would have your vehicle running. Now with increasing conscious uh, uh, feeling that we have to be environmentally friendly when we uh, operate our vehicles, we would like to operate our vehicle with as minimum amount of fuel as possible right. So, uh, to do this uh, we want to ensure that the fuel that enters the engine is completely burnt. You do not want unburnt fuel coming off the uh, exhaust of the uh, vehicle if, because if it is unburnt you are inefficiently using your fuel right. So, that is the uh, thing you want it completely burnt. It is also true that as your vehicle is moving we are often applying a brake, we are uh, accelerating, we are decelerating etcetera. So, the amount of fuel that goes into the uh, engine uh, increases, decreases, uh, comes to a halt lot of different things are happening in the engine continuously right. It is not that the engine is operating at a single fixed operating point that is not the way it works. 
continuously the operating point of the engine is changing in the typical driving cycle that most of us experience. So, uh, it is very important that uh, for you to run the engine efficiently, the amount of uh, fuel that goes in should be matched with the amount of uh, oxygen that goes in or air that goes in and this match should be at some appropriate value so that uh, the fuel is completely burnt. So, uh, we can actually look at three different uh, scenarios, one is called uh, burning uh, rich which means you are actually having a lot of fuel relatively less amount of air uh, and therefore, you will have uh, some wasted fuel in your exhaust. Uh, you could also be burning it the other end of the spectrum which is burning lean which means you send in a lot of air, uh, you burn the fuel completely and then you get a uh, fair amount of air in the exhaust and then there is an in between position. Now, if you want to burn, uh, if you want the engine to, if the purpose of this uh, exercise is to make the engine run as efficiently as possible, you want to run it closer to the lean side, so that you are you know completely burning the uh, fuel. Uh, on the other hand, maybe uh, if you are use converting your car for uh, race applications, you may choose a different operating point where the engine should run. So, that is the kind of you know fine tuning that people do when they convert a vehicle from a say uh, you know typical uh, consumer uh, vehicle to something that they want to put it for race. So, they will try and see that you know they will change the uh, fuel air ratio, so that uh, if, if, if they are doing it scientifically that is what they would do, that is one of the things that they would do, they would uh, adjust the fuel air ratio, so that they are getting maximum power for example. So, something like that they would have to do. So, now how does the oxygen sensor work, you basically have uh, a pipe in which the let us say uh, I will remove this, let, let us say this is a pipe through which the exhaust is going. In this you will have a sensor and uh, that sensor let us say is attached here and you have a small electrode here and you will also have a small electrode here and then it continues. So, uh, the inner side of this sensor sees the exhaust stream that is uh, it sees this exhaust, the inner side of this uh, sensor right. So, it is seeing the exhaust, the outside of the sensor is seeing air, ambient air is what it is seeing. So, now uh, if you go to high enough temperature which is what uh, this uh, uh, sensor is going to be sitting at especially given that it is an oxy, uh, oxygen ion conductor zirconia, uh, you will see a potential difference between this side and this side. You will see a potential difference if the oxygen ion concentration on either side is different. Okay. So, if you have different oxygen ion concentration uh, inside the exhaust, uh, exhaust pipe compared to the oxygen ion concentration, uh, I mean oxygen concentration on the outside of the pipe, then you will see a potential difference. So, now when you run fuel rich, right, when you run fuel rich, uh, what you are doing is you are sending in a lot of fuel, uh, which means you are completely consuming the oxygen, you have excess fuel in the uh, exhaust stream. So, which means in the pipeline, the exhaust pipe, you will see a stream which is mostly fuel, very little to no oxygen. On the outside, you have a lot of uh, air, lot of oxygen. So, since the uh, you know um, chemical potential of oxygen is high on the outside and it is uh, minimal to 0 on the inside, you see a potential difference. Okay, and that is the potential difference that you measure. So, it turns out to be about 0.9 volts. If you go the other extreme, if you send excess air into the engine, then you will find a situation where the exhaust stream also has a fair amount of air, what is outside the exhaust stream also has a fair amount of air. So, there is not much of a potential difference between the inside and the outside. So, then you see 0.1 volts going closer to 0 any in between position you have, you have some ratio that you are working on. So, this is a typical ratio that many engines uh, might try to use and uh, in that case you will start seeing voltages somewhere in the middle. So, what you can do is and which is what the car manufacturers do, they will select the uh, ratio of fuel to air that they would like their uh, engine to uh, operate at and this information is fed into the computer uh, in the car and the potential from the uh, uh, oxygen sensor is also fed into the uh, uh, exhaust, I mean into the computer in the car. And instructions are given that you should try to keep mixing the fuel and air such that it stays, that potential stays close to some value. So, let us say they have said 0.45 volts, then what it will do is as you accelerate and decelerate, uh, the uh, engine will keep on, the car will keep on adjusting the amount of fuel going in and the amount of uh, oxygen going in to keep pulling it back towards the 0.45 uh, volt uh, operating point 
right. So, it will mix the fuel and air, increase the air or decrease the air etcetera and try to keep it at that 0.45 volt. So, this is how you can ensure that the engine uh, behaves in a consistent manner uh, as the vehicle operates over a wide range of operating conditions. And you must uh, understand that uh, the vehicle operating conditions are changing several times every second, maybe 5, 6 times every second the uh, uh, requirements are changing. So, that fast this feedback loop should be, you should get this feedback from the uh, sensor uh, that fast and you should get the computer to respond accordingly, get change the uh, fuel air ratio immediately. But this is what goes on in a modern auto automobile and this is uh, fairly commonly done and it is based on zirconia. So, again it seems to be a wonder material which we have not heard about. Okay. This is also used as I said for fuel cell applications uh, and you can see here the idea is the same, you have an electrolyte. This electrolyte is based on this uh, yttria stabilized zirconia. And it is an oxygen ion conductor. So, in that sense, it, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the main thing that it does here is also the same that uh, same thing that it does in the uh, you know uh, exhaust sensor that you saw in the automobile oxygen sensor in the automobile except that here it is not just sensing the potential difference it is actually conducting the oxygen ions and enabling the uh, uh, reaction to happen and it ends up uh, that this fuel cell will operate at about high uh, at high temperatures uh, around 1000 degrees centigrade so that is the way it, in which it works Zirconia is also used as a uh, gate dielectric. So, uh, it is used for uh, something called a MOSFET uh, which is the it is an acronym for a short form for metal, oxide, semiconductor, field effect transistor. So, this is the uh, general idea here and it looks something like this. Okay, so, uh, we have a p type uh, semiconductor here, we also have another p type semiconductor, this is n type and then this is a gate, oxide gate which would be made of zirconia and then you have metal contact. So, this would serve as a source and this would serve as a drain and you can control the current that goes from the source to the drain by applying a potential uh, across this gate. So, this gate would either restrict the flow of current between the source and the drain or allow the current between the source and the drain and it is in that form uh, that process that it uh, function as uh, functions as this uh, transistor uh, behavior and there is a metal oxide there, uh, there is a metal, there is an oxide and there is a semiconductor and uh, using the field uh, we are uh, uh, enabling this to operate as a transistor. So, uh, zirconia is used in this uh, context. So, we see again that zirconia seems to be some kind of a wonder material, uh, it is getting used for all these things, it is used for a gem as a gem, it is used as a catalyst, uh, it is used for thermal barrier coatings, um, biomet uh, material applications, uh, dental applications uh, so to speak, um, oxygen sensors in automobiles, um, a similar concept being used in fuel cells and as a gate dielectric. So, this is a wide range of things, this is used uh, inside the human body, it is used uh, in vehicles that we use, it is used in medical applications for uh, oxygen sensors uh, and, uh, and also for uh, vehicular applications, it is used in uh, semiconductor devices, uh, catalysts uh, for uh, you know organic synthesis and of course, for decorative ap applications such as gems. Now, the important thing is as I said, there is this monoclinic phase which is stable at room temperature all the way up to about 1100 degrees centigrade, nearly 1200 degrees C centigrade. Then there is a tetragonal phase which is stable from there for another 1000 odd degrees centigrade. So, till about 2300, 2400 degrees centigrade the tetragonal phase is stable and after that the cubic phase is stable. So, the interesting thing is that what is observed in the system 
is that if you take this system, the, so all this when I say this phase is stable at room temperature, it turns out that this uh, stability is something that uh, is uh, noticed when you are looking at large crystal structures of this system. So, large crystal structure zirconia uh, at room temperature is monoclinic, uh, at large crystal structure zirconia at about uh, 1000 to 2000 degree centigrade is tetragonal and the same large crystal structure zirconia past about 2400 degree C is cubic uh, in nature. Uh, but when you take the same material and you go to the nano scale of it, you simply and so you have done nothing other than change the crystal size, no other change you are making, you are not changing the composition in any way, you are simply changing the crystal size. If you change the crystal size, it turns out that suddenly there is a reversal of phase stability that is seen at the nano scale. So, this is very important, it may not seem like much, but what it means is that a different phase uh, is now stable at room temperature which you were not expecting uh, it to be and uh, that is very important because the properties of the material change because uh, the phase has changed. Therefore, at room temperature you can now have zirconia giving you completely new properties uh, which you otherwise did not expect from zirconia at room temperature and one atmosphere pressure and therefore you can do something new, some new application you can use uh, the same zirconia material uh, for. So, uh, that is the beauty of it and that has happened simply by going to the nano scale. So, let us look a little bit more on, uh, on why uh, this has happened. See when you say phase stability, the idea of phase stability is uh, intricately connected to the thermodynamic aspects of it, right. So, that is uh, the thermodynamics decides which, uh, which phase is stable under what conditions. So, you look at thermodynamic uh, properties and particularly you look at free energy and then the uh, phase which has the lowest free energy is the one that is stable and under those uh, conditions. So, when you say that there is a reversal of phase stability, when you say there is a reversal of phase stability, it means that something has happened to the thermodynamics of the system, that the thermodynamics of the system has changed in some manner and that is the reason why some other phase is now showing you a free energy that is the lower uh, value and as a result that is the phase that is now stable at room temperature. So, you can ask the question. Uh, has the thermodynamics changed? Uh, the uh, direct answer to it is no, the thermodynamics is uh, thermodynamics, it is sort of a fundamental law, nothing changes there. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the issues uh, we see when we learn thermodynamics is that we tend to see equations written in a certain way and uh, which often uh, is the case because that equation is associated with a certain system under certain conditions. And as a result, uh, the same system under some totally other conditions may have a few more terms in that equation which are relevant only under those conditions. Whereas, if you come back to your regular conditions, those other terms may not be relevant. And as a result, when you write the equation in the macroscopic scale, you can actually write a lot of other terms there, all of which will evaluate to values close to 0 and as a result, we can neglect them. It is just that in the typical thermodynamics book, they do not write all the terms and say all these, you know, we, there are these other 4 or 5 terms I can write and all the other 4 or 5 terms are all 0 and therefore, we are left with these 3 terms. If you often do not see that explicitly stated, if you actually uh, looked around in the book and read the words carefully, you will see hints that that is what they are referring to uh, and generally that seems to work fine. But when you go to the nano scale, suddenly you find these additional terms which were evaluating to 0 are now no longer evaluating to 0. And uh, since they are getting some larger and larger value, more significant value, they suddenly affect the total outcome of that equation and therefore, the value you are getting for that equation is now different. And now that it is different, uh, the uh, result that you see, the impact that it has uh, is now beginning to become different. So, that is the idea that we are going to explore a little bit. So, uh, if you see here, we write delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. This is the way we write our uh, free energy changes uh, in the uh, uh, typical uh, case that we uh, uh, discuss. Now, uh, we always say that you know for whichever phase is stable, the free energy is the lowest uh, and so you are looking for the lowest free energy. So, if you are comparing uh, a system where let us say the uh, chemistry is the same, you are not changing, uh, let us say it is a single phase system. It is single phase, uh, it has uniform composition. And, um, and let us say within the phase of course, since it is a single phase, it is all the same crystal structure and so on. Uh, then uh, you do not have much impact of uh, and if let us say you are comparing two such uh, single phase systems, you are comparing one single phase system 
uh, in this case let us say we are comparing the monoclinic system to the tetragonal system both of zirconia. Then as long as you have not changed the composition in any way zirconia is zirconia whether it is monoclinic or tetragonal and therefore uh, aspects let us say associated with configurational entropy, configurational entropy of the system. aspects associated with the configurational entropy of the system are not that important to us uh, because uh, the, you are not really changed it is not like you have introduced a new element into the system and therefore you need to look at the randomness of the system etc. So largely it does not seem to be uh, uh, involved. So uh, the impact of the uh, sort of the T delta S term um, in the overall uh, scheme of things is, uh, uh, is not as pronounced uh, in any different manner uh, so to speak uh, between the, uh, the macro scale and the uh, no nano scale so to speak. On the other hand it turns out that delta H the enthalpy uh, has uh, uh, some dependence actually a significant dependence to some degree uh, on the crystal size and uh, this is something that we need to understand and that is the reason why uh, uh, this dependence is uh, so much dependent on the uh, crystal size that at large crystal size the uh, crystal size dependence reduces to 0 and then you only see the delta H whereas uh, of any transformation between one phase and the other phase. When you go to smaller crystallite size you see uh, the same transformation delta H still being present but you also have a crystal size effect showing up in the delta H and that affects the uh, uh, outcome so to speak. And therefore, it is interesting to follow changes in delta H as you go to smaller and smaller crystal sizes and that of course is done using calorimetry and we saw that in our previous class uh, uh, we discussed calorimetry to some degree to understand what is happening there, uh, how is that measured, uh, why is it significant and so on. So calorimetry is used and, and I also told you at that time that when you are looking at thermodynamics of the system calorimetry is a very uh, uh, important tool, a very useful tool uh, that conveys uh, many things to us. So, if you look at a transformation, okay. so you have a delta H monoclinic uh, in this case I have put M small subscript as uh, uh, M and uh, the uh, this is nanocrystalline tetragonal. So, this is monoclinic Okay. So, normally this is the this term is what we would get the when you did uh, when you do this uh, transformation from monoclinic to tetragonal. So, this is monoclinic to tetragonal ok. So, uh, uh, please see the difference this term here the second term that I have now put in circle. Uh, is monoclinic large crystal size to tetragonal large crystal size that is what this is ok. So, I will just write that here large crystal size this is also large crystal size whereas what you have on the left side left hand side of the equation is monoclinic also large crystal size. to uh, uh, tetragonal but nanocrystalline size tetragonal but nanocrystalline. So, this is uh, so you can see that when you normally took uh, I mean when you normally take uh, uh, the uh, uh, monoclinic uh, zirconia of large crystal size and you put it in a uh, in, in, in a calorie meter and then you uh, start heating it up uh, and finding out what heat is uh, going in and what transformation is happening and so on. Uh, what you are actually getting and what you are actually measuring is the term that I have circled here which is the delta H of transformation from monoclinic large crystal size to tetragonal large crystal size. And this delta H is what you would plug in into the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S equation and that is where you will get all the other uh, uh, you know decisions you will make based on that. What is there that is missing in that information is this A T comma T and that is the where A T 
is the surface area or we will say specific surface area because we are always going to look at it on a per uh, unit mass basis or per unit mole basis. So, specific surface area um, of the tetragonal phase. and the gamma is the surface energy. Okay. So, uh, you can see here, so let us say uh, we have uh, you know if you are looking at uh, specific surface area. So, that is essentially uh, the area I mean uh, that one, 1 gram of that material would correspond to. So, clear, clearly when the crystal size is larger. Uh, so, the same 1 gram will now have a certain amount of surface area associated with it. If you keep reducing that crystal size and therefore, you will have many many more small crystals, uh, you will have uh, you know uh, higher and higher surface area for the same 1 gram of that material. right? So, the uh, area goes up dramatically uh, for the same weight of the material, the same uh, number of moles of the material, and the area goes up uh, dramatically when you go from a crystal size of say 1 centimeter to a crystal size of say. 50 nanometers or 100 nanometers, right. So, when you go down, uh, so you are looking at going from uh, 10 power minus 2 meters to 10 power uh, say minus. Uh, so, if you are looking at um, 50 or 100, uh, 10 nanometers, let us say you are looking at 10 power minus 8 meters, let us say, okay. So, that is the uh, radius, radius is going from 10 power minus 2 to 10 power minus 8. So, you are looking at 6 orders of magnitude uh, difference in uh, radius. And therefore, you are looking at say 12 orders of magnitude uh, uh, difference in uh, the uh, surface area. So, you will you do a pi r square. So, uh, 10 power minus 6, 10 power minus 6, you will have 10 power minus 12. So, you will have 12 orders of magnitude. So, huge difference in surface area, right. So, that is the uh, uh, significant thing. And therefore, even if the gamma is small, because the A becomes very large for the same mass, so same number of moles, this term starts becoming very significant. So, you can see this is what I said when I said that you know in uh, thermodynamic uh, uh, systems and thermodynamic discussions, uh, we have additional terms uh, available in the equation which we do not highlight normally. Because many times for most of our discussion, uh, we would have dealt with systems where this uh, you know specific surface area is so uh, uh, negligible that its impact on the system is uh, irrelevant. So, we only talk uh, of terms where the impact, uh, their impact is relevant, is significant to the uh, discussion. And so, therefore, in most uh, most of the other situations where we would have run into this equation, we would not have written down a t gamma. So, that term would itself would not be there. Although technically it is there, it is just that its contribution is negligible, it is minuscule. Suddenly, you see its contribution is very significant. And as a result, you start seeing a huge impact on the uh, transformation. And so, interesting, interestingly what happens is you can do this monoclinic to tetragonal, monoclinic to cubic, monoclinic to amorphous. So, all these kinds of things you can uh, calculate. Uh, using calorimetry, uh, typically you do drop solution calorimetry for this. There is uh, one, I uh, uh, will show you a reference where they have done a very extensive study uh, of this uh, system. And so, that uh, uh, reference is out here. So, you can go and see this, it is a 2005 paper uh, in the Journal of American uh, Ceramic Society, where they have done a significant amount of work uh, in, in this uh, area. You can actually see how carefully they have done their experiments. Uh, I mean so much thought has gone into everything like you know what is the state of water there, how they are handling the water there and so on uh, and they are able to get this uh, uh, information. So, basically what they, they do is uh, just to show you a trend of what kind of uh, in information they get. So, they have surface area here and uh, you have this uh, delta H uh, data out here and what you will see is that uh, so, this if increasing surface area right increasing surface area or surface area specific surface area let us say surface area per mole. So, increasing surface area uh, means you are going to smaller and smaller crystal size. So, this means you are going to nano material size towards nano scale. This side is towards macro scale materials. So, actually it turns out that you will see uh, at the macro scale you will see monoclinic, you will see tetragonal 
and let us say you will see amorphous. Cubic uh, we have not plotted here because in their system they tend to see this, uh, they are not able to see cubic at the room temperature, uh, at the room temperature. So, this is all at room temperature, at nano scale, at room temperature. at or near room temperature is what you are looking at. So, normally this is what you would see at room temperature, you will see monoclinic phase that is the most stable, then you would see tetragonal and then if you if you manage to get amorphous scale, uh, amorphous uh, material that this is what you would see. Now, what happens is uh, delta G is the same like I'm, like I said the delta H transformation is the same, uh, it is just that the surface area, uh, the surface area contribution, uh, surface area energy contribution to the, uh, uh, the uh, H term, the enthalpy term is different for each of the phases. So, the gamma for each of the phases is different. The gamma for uh, the monoclinic is different, tetragonal is different and amorphous is different. And as a result of the gamma as you uh, that is the slope right. So, the slope is the gamma. So, if I, if I say that the monoclinic phase changes uh, its uh, you know enthalpy uh, as a function of uh, uh, surface area like this, then the slope of this line is that gamma that we are looking at in that equation. So, it turns out that they see something like this for monoclinic, they see something like this for tetragonal. And they see something like this for amorphous. So, they see that the gamma value for the three different phases is different. Uh, and so, as you keep increasing, so its impact is to uh, impact the slope uh, of that uh, line. Uh, as of uh, and therefore, uh, the change in enthalpy as a function of uh, the surface area of that uh, sample, uh, which is basically again as a function of the uh, size of that uh, crystals and as you go towards the nano scale, that uh, line keeps going. And so, you see this uh, uh, three different uh, positions of these lines as a result of the surface energy associated with those respective phases. Now, as I said, the uh, uh, stable phase is one where the delta G is the lowest and in this case the delta H would have to be the lowest if you are assuming that the T delta S term is uh, relatively uh, uh, unimpacting I mean relatively the same for all the conditions. So, then therefore, you see that the lowest uh, the phase with the lowest delta H uh, is the monoclinic phase up to this point. Then the tetragonal phase is lower. and then the amorphous phase is lower. So, this is the work that uh, these people have done and uh, this reference that you see here, uh, they have done this in great detail and they are able to show you something like this, uh, more specific details you see that uh, you will have to look at this reference, uh, but this is the general uh, result that they have obtained and they, sh they show that uh, you know these three phases uh, are showing you. So, at under different, so, so when you are at the macro scale, the monoclinic uh, phase is uh, stable, which is what we are typically seeing. Uh, uh, when you do uh, you know phase stability measurements uh, at room temperature with macroscopic materials. When you go to smaller and smaller sizes, the tetragonal phase becomes stable uh, and that is what you see as you go to nano scale. And then even smaller scales of sizes when you go, the amorphous uh, uh, phase starts becoming stable. Uh, so, therefore, um, whereas at room temperature previously monoclinic was more stable, tetragonal was less stable. When you go to at room temperature, when you now go to the nano scale, tetragonal is more stable, monoclinic is less stable. And this is what they are referring to as phase stability crossover at nano scale, phase stability crossover at nano scale. Uh, and this is a very nice work which uh, very nicely puts together uh, the uh, activity uh, involved in uh, trying to convey this, right. So, uh, what we have seen here is that uh, nano scale and therefore nano materials uh, have interesting implications. Uh, on the thermodynamics associated with the system uh, in which uh, we are uh, exploring this nano scale. Uh, and it really depends on that system. It, in this case, the surface energy terms ended up in this situation that you saw this phase uh, reversal. It may or may not be true in all systems. So, you will have to uh, investigate it in your uh, system of interest or look up uh, values in the literature and see if uh, that suggests that such a, uh, such a reversal could exist. And if you did the right kind of experiments. Uh, using uh, let us say uh, calorimetry and so on, uh, you will be able to uh, put together the data and therefore draw plots of this nature, uh, which will be able to show you this difference uh, of uh, phase stability. Uh, and so, uh, uh, this conveys uh, in a very nice way what uh, uh, how nanoscale impacts the thermodynamics. 
Uh, and so in this course we are now looking at uh, you know primarily looking at uh, nanoscale impact of nanoscale on various properties uh, and uh, the relevance of that impact. Uh, as I told you at the end of the day if there is no difference between the nanoscale and the macro scale then the nanoscale is not interesting to us right. If, if everything at the nanoscale looks exactly the same as it does at the macro scale then why waste our time and effort trying to create the nanomaterial at all. Uh, the whole subject is interesting to us only because things at the nano scale look very different from what they do, lo do uh, look at the macro scale. Then it is uh, interesting to first find out what is the difference, uh, can we use the difference to some uh, you know uh, some interesting application and also to understand why there is that difference. So this uh, set of classes that we had, uh, uh, this one and the few uh, two, three ones before this uh, are all looking at the thermodynamic aspect of uh, the nano scale and uh, how you analyze it, where you see a difference and why there is a difference. So with this we will halt, we will look at other aspects from our next class, thank you.